Hello and welcome back. I'm Steph Sabra, um, joined by myself and you. <laughs> What's up? We're gonna watch Dr. Shashi Thoreau, MP. Britain does owe reparations. If there's anything that I love, it is uh, hating on the Brits in their past. I do. I love the Brits, but they've done some really bad things. So they're they're an easy an easy thing to hate on so we'll see what this video is all about before we get into it make sure you hit that subscribe button bell icon all notifications and vote this up all right let's get cheeky president <clears throat> And gentlemen, ladies of the house, I, standing here with eight minutes uh, in my hands and uh, at this venerable and rather magnificent institution, I was going to assure you that I belong to the Henry VIII School of Public Speaking, that as Henry VIII said to his wives, I shall not keep you long. <laughs> but now finding myself, but now finding myself the seventh speaker out of eight in what must already seem a rather long evening to you, I rather feel like Henry VIII's last wife. I more or less know what's expected of me, but I'm not sure how to do it any differently. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps what I should do is really try and pay attention to the arguments that were advanced by the opposition today. We had, for example, Sir Richard Ottawa suggesting, challenging the very idea that it could be argued that the economic situation of the colonies was actually worsened by the experience of British colonialism. Well, I stand to offer you the Indian example, Sir Richard. India's share of the world economy when Britain arrived on its shores was 23%. By the time the British left, it was down to below 4%. Yikes. Why? Simply because India had been governed for the benefit of Britain. In Britain's rise for 200 years was financed by its depredations in India. In fact, Britain's industrial revolution was actually premised upon the deindustrialization of India. The handloom weavers, for example, famed across the world, whose products were exported around the world, Britain came right in. There were actually these weavers making fine muslin, light as woven air, it was said. And Britain came right in, smashed their thumbs, broke their looms, imposed tariffs and duties on their cloth and products, and started, of course, uh, taking the raw materials from India and shipping back manufactured cloth, flooding the world's markets with what became the products of the dark and satanic mills of Victorian England. That uh, meant that the weavers in India became beggars, and India went from being a world-famous exporter of finished cloth into an importer went from having 27% of world trade to, to less than 2%. Yikes. Meanwhile, colonialists like Robert Clive bought their rotten boroughs in England on the proceeds of their loot in India, while taking the Hindi word loot into their dictionaries as well as their habits. Yikes. Uh, whilst, and the British had the gall I love to a good call him read. Clive of India as if he belonged to the country, when all he really did was to ensure that much of the country belonged to him. <laughs> By the end of the 19th century, the fact is that India was already Britain's biggest cash cow, the world's biggest purchaser of British goods and exports, and the source of highly paid employment for British civil servants. We literally paid for our own oppression. And as has been pointed out, the wealthy Victorian British families that made their money out of, out of the slave economy. One fifth of, 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 the, of the elites of, of the wealthy class in Britain in the 19th century owed their money to transporting three million Africans across the waters. And in fact, in 1833, when slavery was abolished, what happened was that a compensation of 20 million pounds was paid not as reparations to those who had lost their lives or, or who had suffered or been oppressed by slavery, but to those who had lost their property. Stop. I was struck by the fact that your Wi-Fi password of this union commemorates the name of Mr. Gladstone, the great liberal hero. Well, I'm sorry, his family was one of those who benefited from, the, from this compensation. 
Staying with India, between 15 and 29 Read million them. Indians died of starvation in British-induced famines. The most famous example, of course, was the Great Bengal Famine during the Second World War, when four million people died because Winston Churchill deliberately, as a matter of written militant policy, proceeded to divert essential supplies from civilians in Bengal to sturdy Tommies and Europeans uh, as reserve stockpiles. He said that the starvation of any way underfed Bengalis mattered much less than that of sturdy Greeks. This is uh, Churchill's actual quote. And when conscious stricken British officials wrote to him, pointing out that people were dying because of this, of this decision, he peevishly wrote in the margins of the file, why hasn't Gandhi died yet? Oh my So all God. notions that the British were trying to do their colonial enterprise out of enlightened despotism to try and bring the benefits of, of colonialism and civilization to the benighted heathen. I'm sorry, Churchill's conduct in 43, simply one example of many that gave a lie to this myth. As others have said and on the proposition, violence and racism were the reality of the colonial experience. And no wonder that the sun never sat, set on the British Empire because even God couldn't trust the English in the dark. <laughs> Let me take World War I as a, as a very concrete example since the first speaker, Mr. Lee, suguested these things couldn't be quantified. Well, let me quantify World War I for you. Again, I'm sorry, from an Indian perspective, others have spoken of other countries. One sixth of all the British forces that fought on the war were Indian. 54,000 Indians actually lost their lives in that war. 65,000 were wounded. Another 4,000 remained missing or in prison. Indian taxpayers had to cough up 100 million pounds in that time's money. India supplied 70 million rounds of ammunition, 600,000 rifles and machine guns, 42 million garments were stitched and sent out of India. And 1.3 million Indian personnel served in this war. I know all this because, of course, the, the, the commemoration of the centenary has just taken place. But not just that, India had to supply 173,000 animals, 370 million tons of supplies, and in the end, the total value of everything that was taken out of India. India and India, by the way, suffering from recession at that time and poverty and hunger was in today's money, eight billion pounds. Oh my goodness. You want quantification? It's available. Second World War, it was even worse. Two and a half million Indians in uniform. I won't belabor the point, but of Britain's total war debt of three billion pounds in 1945 money, 1.25 billion was owed to India and never actually paid. Somebody mentioned Scotland. Well, the fact is, that colonialism actually cemented your union with Scotland. You know, the Scots had actually tried to send colonies out uh, before 1707. They'd all failed, I'm sorry to say. But then, of course, came union and India was available. And there you had a disproportionate employment of Scots. I'm sorry, Mr. Mackenzie has to speak after me. Engaged <laughs> in this colonial enterprise as soldiers, as merchants, as agents, as employees, and the earnings from India is what brought prosperity to Scotland, even pulled, pulled Scotland out of poverty. Now that India is no longer there, no wonder the bonds are loosening. <laughs> now, we've heard other arguments on this side. There's been a, a mention of the railways. Well, let me tell you, first of all, as my colleague, the Jamaican High Commission has pointed out, uh, railways and roads were really built to serve British interests and not those of the local people. But I might add that many countries have built railways and roads without having had to be colonized in order to do so. Uh, they... Okay, here, here. They were designed to carry raw materials from the hinterland into the ports to be shipped to Britain. And the fact is that the Indian or Jamaican or other colonial public, their needs were incidental transportation, there was no attempt made to match supply to demand for mass transport, none whatsoever. Instead, in fact, the Indian railways were built with massive incentives offered by Britain to British investors, guaranteed out of Indian taxes paid by Indians, with the result that you actually had one mile of Indian railway costing twice what it cost to build the same mile in Canada or Australia because there was so much money being paid in extravagant returns. Britain made all the profits, controlled the technology, supplied all the equipment, and absolutely all these benefits came as private enterprise 
British private enterprise at public risk, Indian public risk. That was the, the, the railways as an accomplishment. We're hearing about aid. I think it was, uh, it was, it was again, Sir Richard Ottawa mentioned uh, uh, British aid to India. Well, let me just point out that British aid to India is about 0.4% of India's GDP. The government of India actually spends more on fertilizer subsidies, which might be an appropriate metaphor for that argument. <laughs> if I may point out as well. Yeah, drink your water. You're spilling the tea. If I may point out as well that... Um, that as my fellow speakers from the proposition have pointed out, there have been incidents of racial violence, of loot, of massacres, of bloodshed, of transportation, in India's case, even of one of our, our last Mughal emperor. Yes, maybe today's Britons are not responsible for some of these depredations, but the same speakers have pointed with pride to their foreign aid. You're not responsible for the people starving in Somalia, but to give them aid, surely the principle of reparations for what is for the wrongs that have been done cannot be denied. It's been pointed out, for Great example, point. the dehumanization of Africans in the Caribbean, the massive psychological damage that has been done, the undermining of social traditions, of property rights, of, of the authority structures of these societies, all in the interests of, of, of British colonialism. And the fact remains that many of today's problems in these countries, including the persistence, in some cases, the creation of racial and ethnic and religious tensions, were the direct result of the colonial experience. So there is a moral debt that needs to be paid. Yes. Someone challenged uh, reparations elsewhere. Well, I'm sorry, Germany doesn't just give reparations to Israel. It also gave reparations to Poland. Perhaps some of the speakers here are too young to remember the dramatic picture of Chancellor Willy Brandt on his knees in the Warsaw Ghetto in 1970. And there are other examples. There is uh, Italy's reparations to Libya. There's Japan's to Korea. Even Britain has paid reparations to the New Zealand Maoris. So it's not as if this is something unprecedented or unheard of that's going to somehow open some sort of nasty Pandora's box. No wonder Professor Lewis reminded us that he's from Texas. There's a wonderful expression in Texas that summarizes the arguments of the opposition, all hat and no cattle. <laughs> now, if I can just quickly look through the other notes I was scribbling while they were speaking. There was reference to democracy and rule of law. Let me say with the greatest possible respect, you can, it's a bit rich. It's a really interesting point on reparations that I hadn't heard voiced like that, where we are so afraid to give reparations for the actual wrong we have done as countries to a people, but we are very quick to give money and donations and aid to countries that we were not involved with, which feels so anti everything we're taught as people it's usually we fix the problems we start we help what we caused whatever it may be the cause and effect it's like we totally overlook those laws and those principles because i don't know like this inherent shame that we have as a country or a people for what our forefathers or what our ancestors have done it's so against i feel like what is right and i just thought that was a it was brilliantly pointed out there i love how he kept notes of everything everyone said this is my type of guy keep your receipts let me say with the greatest possible respect you can it's a bit rich to oppress, enslave, kill, torture, maim people for 200 years and then celebrate the fact that they're democratic at the end of it. We... Yes. I love him. We were denied democracy, sir. We had to snatch it, seize it from you. With the greatest reluctance, it was conceded in India's case after 150 years of British rule and that too with limited franchise. Yes, indeed, ma'am. The opposition spoke quite highly of Greek and Athenian democracy on which the West should pride itself and spoke of liberty and equality in that same name. The Athenian democracy was only functioning because of the slave society on which it was built. That's the nature of colonisation. All right, I don't think that needs, uh, needs contradiction, not for me at any rate. <laughs> but but if, I, if, I may just, if I may just point out, I think the argument made by a couple of the speakers, the first speaker, Mr. Lee in particular, conceded all the evil atrocities of colonialism, but essentially suggested that reparations won't really help, they won't help the right people, they'll be used as a propaganda tool, they'll embolden people like Mr. Mugabe. It's always nice how in the old days, you know, uh, I'm sorry to say that uh, the, the people of the Caribbean used to 
frighten their children into behaving and sleeping by saying Sir Francis Drake would come after them. <laughs> that was a legacy of that. Of that. Now, now it's Mugabe will be there. So this is the, the new sort of Sir Francis Drake of our times. The fact is, the fact is very simply, sir, that we are not talking about reparations as a tool to empower anybody. They're a tool for you to atone for the wrongs that have been done. Mm. And I... Yes, very interesting. I am quite prepared to accept the proposition that you can't evaluate, put a, put a, a monetary sum on the kinds of horrors people have suffered. Certainly no amount of money can expiate the loss of a loved one, as, as somebody pointed out that there. That part. Uh, you're not going to be able to figure out an exact amount. But the principle is what matters. The fact is that to speak blithely of sacrifices on both sides, uh, as an analogy was used here, a burglar comes into your house, ransacks the place, stubs his toe, and you say, well, he, there was a sacrifice on both sides. That, I'm sorry to say, is not an acceptable, is not an acceptable argument. Um, the truth is that um, we are not arguing specifically that vast sums of money need to be paid. The proposition before this house is the principle of owing reparations, not the fine points of how much is owed, to whom it should be paid. The question is, is there a debt? Does Britain owe reparations? As far as I'm concerned, the ability to acknowledge a wrong that has been done, to simply say sorry, will go a far, far, far longer way than some percentage of GDP in, 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 form, in the form of, of, of aid. What is required, it seems to me, is accepting the principle that reparations are owed. Personally, I'd be quite happy if it was one pound a year for the next 200 years after the last 200 years of Britain and India. Thank you very much, Madam President. Very well said. I used to do debate. Um, and it's hard when you're coming after someone like you have to write down all these notes because you're addressing everything they said, not necessarily what you want to talk about. Oftentimes it does bring up interest of topics and points of views that you'd like to share. So I'm sure a lot of it was already in his head, but the skill of debate is it's such a talent and he did such a great job. We have reparation conversations and arguments in the States all the time ongoing never ending because we like Britain have created and done some of the most horrific things to groups of people to nations um, and have not atoned for it and you hear especially with the Native Americans uh, um, this being their homeland before American colonizers came here and called it theirs and you know the it really was a genocide and there now we have some sovereignty and some spaces that are just for natives but they're oftentimes abused we've seen it with the pipelines they continue to kind of go against the negotiations that were made but in terms of enslaved people there have never been reparations and one form of reparation we had was affirmative action because of the absolute shit show we caused for generations of black Americans, African Americans in the States, the redlining that was done, the Jim Crow era segregation, all of these things, it wasn't just slavery, it was everything after, well into the 60s when the civil rights movement happened. And then we get affirmative action and then only for in 2023, us to eliminate affirmative action, one of the small tools that can aid against things like legacy and things like the same types of people from the same types of communities getting into the highest colleges, having the highest form of education, having the highest form of access to information and education and knowledge and everything that comes there for after. And we eliminated it. And then you still have this question of reparations, right? And oftentimes the answer, which I loved how he pointed out, is people say, well, how long do we have to pay for the sins of our ancestors? And it's like, why don't you start with the apology, with actually any 
any sort of conversation or acknowledgement that it happened and like you get this scoff kind of we did it i'm sorry my our people didn't it's like you teach your kids to give an honest apology right we don't teach our kids to be like so sorry you're upset that i hit you in the face that's not an apology right that's you scoffing and being a dickhead it, it's you say i'm sorry that i hit you um how can i help right and it's so interesting with one of the most atrocious human acts being enslaving a people we don't have a proper way of condoning that my favorite point that he brought up is how easy how quick we are to give aid across countries and um, in different continents in America the United States does it all the time but when it's your own people now or the people that you have harmed in such a great and deadly and disgusting way we don't have that and I think that there is that has to do a lot with human pride and just the folly of human nature where we're embarrassed and or shame filled i'm not sure it should be shame filled but that doesn't mean it stops you for atoning so i think it's quite interesting especially because he's not answering the question of how reparation should be done the question is just should there be reparations and i do think that the answer is yes actually changing things in the legal system that make it possible to accumulate generational wealth in the way that in the states this is like the comparison that i know best obviously being a united states citizen is that you have to have systems in place that make people able to climb up the ladder in the way that people like white americans have been able to climb since the beginning of time so it's more than just money and uh, a handout which is a word that people love to use here it's really understanding what are the laws in place what are the systems in place that are holding people back that are pe keeping people contained in poverty and not have this ability to find financial freedom because financial freedom has been snatched from groups of people in the states from the beginning of time but anyways that sparked just so much interesting conversation in my head and i thought that was awesome i want to see more of what of dr shashi and what he does that was very interesting thanks for letting us watch this um if you enjoyed it leave a like make sure you subscribe if you haven't already give a comment down below on uh, your thoughts about this i think it's fascinating and it's an open discussion that i think involves so many countries and so many groups of people so um i'm steph sabra and i will see you later much love